validation, all those kind of lovely things. Um, work in the open, soft, open source software group. Um, there's a small group of us doing architecture stuff. So we've got a good relationship with the architecture group there. And as part of that, I've also worked on the architecture memory model. And I'm also involved with the C++ memory model. So I've kind of got my fingers in lots of memory model pies. So we get to talk about concurrency. So you might think I love concurrency, but actually I really don't like it at all. I think it's the problem and not the solution. And um, kind of as a rubbish analogy, imagine you're paying for an upgrade on a flight. So you've got a nice chair here, really big, there's a glass of champagne, you've got a window, loads of space, it probably turns into a bed at the flick of a switch. It's exactly what you want. You pay through the nose for this seat, and instead they give you this. They give you four seats at the back. So maybe you can put the armrests up and lie down on it, but it's not really what you wanted. And that's basically what happened with concurrency. And I think we should be complaining more about it because we asked for performance, which is the big seat, and instead they gave us concurrency. So if you can, just say no, don't do it. Um, unfortunately, uh, in the kernel, it's, it's unavoidable. We really can't avoid this. We have to deal with concurrency. It's all over the place. And this ship has long sailed. So what do we provide? Um, in terms of low-level concurrency, and this is not an exhaustive list, I tried to make an exhaustive list and it was just the whole slide deck and it was just all text TT stuff, keywords. But here's some stuff that you can have. So I've tried to organize it from sort of less difficult to really difficult um, in, in order of how to use them. So you've got interrupts and preemption, which you're probably familiar with. So you know it's, it's not quite concurrency, but you can get interrupted. Someone else can modify your state. And then you come back and you find things have changed. Um, we've got locks and mutexes, and you, you can, as you see, you get sort of lower down the list, and it gets more primitive. So we've got atomic T, atomic 6040, the uh, sort of well-known read once, write once, and then some newish acquire release things I'm going to talk about, and then barriers. I'll focus on the bottom sort of four lines during this presentation, but and there's loads more stuff. But we've now got to a point where we can build the stuff at the top using the things at the bottom, and that's the, the cool thing that we can do. So atomics, um, we have atomic T, atomic long T, atomic 64 T. They're guaranteed to be sort of indivisible. Uh, memory model people call this single copy atomic, which is nothing like multi copy atomic. Uh, memory ordering people are really not very good at terminology, but this is a single copy atomic. And it means if you access this thing, you, you're not going to get tearing, essentially. So if you, if you do a set or a store to one of these things and someone else does a, a load or a get on that thing, uh, it'll either see your store or it'll see the old value. You're not going to see half of that. And similar with operations like add. You know, it, it, people will see the old value or the, the value that's been added to. You can't see a, an operation in progress. Memorybarriers.txt, if any, any of you have ever tried to read that, um, it's a barrel of laughs. It doesn't really describe this stuff too well. Uh, so we've, we've now got an atomic t.txt, which is much better. It's quite terse, but it is a lot better. Uh, so I recommend you go there if you want the gory details. <laughs> the core code helpfully says, hey, um, atomics are hard. If you don't want to implement them in your Arch code, I'll give you this generic implementation, which is absolutely crap. You don't want that implementation. It's, it's for architectures that don't have any atomic instructions. So I think it's like 32-bit Spark and PA Risk, and maybe another one. Um, yes, looking at James. <laughs> I want to rip that code out, but I have to keep it for PA Risk. <laughs> ah, OK. I might take you up on that. We'll see. Um, so yes, we have that. You don't want to use that code. Uh, so traditionally, atomic T is, is separated into three sort of classes of operation. There's the get sets, which are unordered. So it's very similar to read once and write once. An example is atomic 64 read. You just want a single copy atomic read of that. Then we have unordered read modify writes, which I say a posted operation. What I mean by that is they're void. They don't, they don't give you any data back. So you say, just go and change the value of memory. I don't care what its value is. And if you want to know about the value, you can use value returning RMW, which then has full ordering. So an example is atomic add return. It gives you back the value that's been added to. I don't know if you believe in no one. I just want to know if you want to explain read once, write once. People here, if, if everyone here understands that. So read once, write once are um, basically single copy access for um, kind of what I said earlier on. So if you write to a variable, um, you either get the whole thing or you don't get any of it. So if you've got concurrent accesses to the same variable, say it's uh, two bytes and you're writing a two byte value, you want to make sure that people see both the bytes updated or neither of them updated, not half an update. That's kind of what they are. So I've come up with five sort of historic limitations of Atomic T. Um, you could probably come up with another five if you thought harder. Uh, so one is that there's a limited set of operations. And these are historic because we fixed all of this. 
Uh, it was a limited set of operation. You can't do add, sub, ink, deck, stuff like that. Uh, you've got no ordering or full ordering, but you don't get anything in between. Um, and sometimes you want something in the middle. You want a little bit of ordering, and I'll talk more about that. Every architecture has to duplicate the whole implementation. So, you know, we, I can't remember how many architectures we got. We just removed some, but there's, there's tens of architectures in the tree, and not everyone who maintains an architecture is an expert in atomics. So they all come up with their own subtly different implementation, and then you get this emergent semantics rather than actually anything you can rely on. They're independent of things like exchange and comp exchange. So you have comp exchange and you have atomic comp exchange, which are basically the same thing, but they get implemented twice for no real good reason. And I'd say, like I said, they're not well defined or understood. And we shouldn't be forcing Arch maintainers to implement these things. We should be giving them a hand. <laughs> so over the, well, since 2013, there's a bunch of us who've been working on fixing this. I'm not gonna go through all the commits. Um, but these are the milestones. So in between these, there's a little more going on. Uh, we've now got a maintainer's entry for this stuff. There's a whole bunch, bunch of stuff that's gone on, um, implementing new memory models and new, uh, new operations as well. <coughs> so some of the extensions that we've done uh, are the following. So we've got bitwise operations now. So rather than just having atomic add and atomic sub, you've got atomic or, atomic and, stuff like that. Um, We've got fetch ops, which give you back the old value. So when you had atomic add return before, you get the value that's been added to. So if you do atomic add return one on zero, you'll get one back. Whereas a fetch op will give you the old value, which will be zero. Um, and the cool thing about them is actually we've got these new suffixes. So if you have an atomic add return, it used to be fully ordered. Now you can add things on the end. So you can say atomic add return relaxed or atomic add return acquire. And I'm gonna go through each, each one of those in a minute explaining what they mean. Um, but it gives you a lot more flexibility. And actually, at this point, we're, we're starting to look like we're offering the same sort of functionality that you get from languages such as uh, C11, um, where you have actually atomics built into the, the language themselves. We're offering a similar kind of uh, set of um, intrinsics there. We've also got this quite weird one, SMP con load acquire, which allows you to pull on a variable until it changes. And actually, architectures can implement that quite efficiently. So on ARM, for example, we can stop the clock for the CPU. Um, and only wake up when there's a change made. And then the core code now, it, it can actually provide you a comp exchange based atomics implementation. So or, if all you do is tell the core code, hey, this is how you do comp exchange on my architecture, you will get a whole suite of atomics. You'll get all of those implemented and we can generate bit ops for you as well. So what that means, if you're writing core kernel code, you can just rely on these things existing. You don't have to care about the underlying architecture that you're running on, they're gonna be there. And that also means then that we can build um, things like the scheduler or even things like spin locks using these lower level primitives, just relying on them being there. And the old API is still there. It's, this is all extensions to that. So here's a relaxed looking kind of guy using atomics. Uh, relaxed are actually quite hard to use, I'll be honest. Uh, there are some places where you do want to use them, but most of the time you don't. They're unordered, so even the compiler can move these things around, which is, you really can't do any synchronization with relaxed on their own. Um, single copy atomic, which is what I've been talking about so far. You know, they're indivisible operations. You can't see them tearing. Um, often, you just use them in conjunction with fences. So you have a bunch of relaxed operations and then you have a, a heavyweight fence and a synchronization. So an example here, you've got uh, two CPUs just doing atomic fetch ink relaxed on the shared variable, which is one of our new, new operations. Um, if the variable was initially zero, then you can kind of reason a few things about this code. Like after at the end of time, when they finish running, the variable is gonna be two, and one of them's gonna get zero, and one of them's gonna get one back. And that's kind of all you can really say about that program. If it's C++, you can't even say that, because their memory model's got a bug, but for the kernel, you can say that. So that's all well and good. We've added all this stuff. Unfortunately, one of the reasons I wanted to give this talk was that we've added this stuff, and no one's really using it, you know, apart from me. <laughs> which is a bit of a shame. <laughs> um, so the guys highlighted in red all sit in my office. Um, and I think I reviewed their code and told them they should be using relaxed atomics. So I'd like to try and fix this. Um, <laughs> Peter Z also helped write it. So he should probably be a different color. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's been slow. They are difficult to use. Um, the acquire release variants are much easier to use. Uh, and they're generally safer. So they have a head start as well. They've been in the kernel a bit longer. Um, and they, they're starting to get some more uses. But yeah, 
have a go at using them, please. So at the other end of the spectrum, uh, like I said, we've got fully ordered. And, and that's as if there's an SMP MB, which is our heavy, heavy ordering fence, right, for, um, for uh, concurrent communication. And it's as if there's one of those on either side of the operation. And we do actually have things called SMP MB before Atomic and SMP MB after Atomic. If you want to, for some reason, make a relaxed Atomic behave like a, a fully ordered Atomic, you can stick those barriers either side of it. <laughs> and that will, that will order all access types across the operation, including store to load, which is quite difficult for hardware to do. Uh, difficult, it's expensive to order prior stores against later loads, because it means you can't speculate those loads. Or if you do, you have to do clever tricks to make sure that they're up to date. Um, and that kind of ordering is expensive even on x86. For their, for their remodify rights, they're always expensive on x86, but I think it was worth pointing that out. Some people say this is a sequentially consistent restoring barrier, but it's just a parlance you might hear. And the really weird thing I think about SMP MB is it gives you ordering even in the presence of racy writes, which you normally don't care about. Like there are some places in the scheduler or some parts of RCU which do care about that, but most people don't care about racy writes because reasoning about it is so, so difficult. So in this kind of weird piece of code at the bottom I've got here, I don't recommend you ever try to write this. Um, I think memory model people call this test R, which is another good example of them not coming up for a very good name for something. Um, so P0 on the left writes one to X, then it has an ink return, just treat that as an SMP MB. I'm trying to convey that it has full ordering there. And then we do a write once of Y to one. And then P1 does a write once of Y to two, has its heavy barrier and then reads X. So the question is, if the final value of Y is two, which means that P1 overwrote P0's value, can you reason about the value of X? And actually the, SM, the, the SMP MB semantics of the atomic uh, remodifier writes there guarantees that you'll see one. But normally you don't care about that because, I mean, who writes code where you have two guys writing the same variable with no synchronization between them? We do it in Linux in a couple of places, but most of the time you don't care about that. Um, so I think SMP MB is kind of, it's giving you more than you really need. It's, it's giving you ordering where you probably don't care. So that's where acquire release comes in. And if any of you played with C11 at all, or C, there was a C++ guy yesterday, right? C++ 11 has this too. Um, but I think this is a more natural fit, uh, and it, it seems to be a good middle ground because it appeals to most programming idioms and it maps well to existing hardware and future hardware, at least future hardware I'm aware of. So the way to think about acquire release is a, uh, as a producer consumer. So you have one thread that's producing data, and so you write a whole load of data out and then you release it, and there's another thread which acquires that data and then processes it. So you can only have write release and you have load acquire. That's kind of the way to think about it. <laughs> and it has this thing people call Roach Motel semantics. So if you look at this picture on the right hand side, it's a stream of instructions. They're AR64 instructions, but the, the LDAR is our acquire instruction and the STLR is our release instruction. And what the release does, it will order everything before it, before the release, and the acquire will order everything after it, after the acquire. But things can still leak in. So it's, it's, not, it's not got the heavy sort of everything before everything after semantics that SMP MB has. And it's more flexible than, uh, than just using fences and it doesn't enforce this store to load order either. So here's, here's an example of this is a, again, it's kind of daft code, but just to illustrate that you can chain these things up um, for another message passing idiom. So if P0 writes X to one and then does a set release or some release operation on Y, P1 picks that up with an acquire, so you can imagine each thread just reads the last guy's operation. All the acquires read from the, the release. Then he, he could, at that point, P1, after he's read uh, the acquire Y, he could read X and he'll get one. That's guaranteed. Right? That's a message passing between two threads. But you can also just palm it off using Z. So he can pick another variable, release that. P2 can acquire that. And then he can read X and he will get one. So you can chain these sort of cumulativity things together. So everyone's just acquiring and releasing, acquiring, releasing, acquiring, releasing, and you, can, you don't have to worry about ordering. It will all just work. If you want to do this with fences, you need to order a read to a write on P1, um, which is going to require an SMP MB, which gives you all those other guarantees that you don't need. Um, so that's kind of the, the nice property of acquire release. You can just do message passing. As long as you, you've got writes to reads and everyone's reading from the previous guy, it works out nicely. And if you look at how that maps down to instructions on architectures, um, actually it's pretty good. Uh, if you look at the first two lines, so that's just 
what, what does a load acquire look like? What does a store release look like? So on x86, they're both just mobs, which is brilliant. There's no, not a fence in sight, and that's because of x86 kind of has this built in. Uh, for ARM64, we've added instructions. We've, we've always had them on ARM64. So we have a load acquire and a store release instruction. That's what those two are. And then even for PowerPC, you get away with a lightweight sync, the LW sync, which is there. They've got two, basically two types of fence, the lightweight one and the heavyweight one. Um, and you can avoid using the heavyweight barrier for acquire release primitives. So it's kind of a win for everybody. I think it's a win for understanding what your code's doing, and it's a win for performance. So it's, I recommend you try to use these. The relaxed stuff, not so much. Acquire release, totally go for it. <laughs> Unfortunately, it gets a bit more murky when you get to the remodify rights. So atomic fetch add release, x86 doesn't have this. So if you do, you have to do a lock x add. Um, so actually on x86, the atomic fetch add release is the same as atomic fetch add require, acquire, sorry, which is the same as atomic fetch add relaxed, the same as atomic fetch add return. They're all the same. It's just going to be lock x add. You get full ordering. But um, for again, for ARM64 and Power, we can do better. So we have an instruction for it, and PowerPC, you can again use the LW, LW sync. Um, as opposed to if you have to throw in SMP MBs, then you start seeing the heavy barriers come out for, for ARM64 and Power, which you want to avoid. And RISC-V also has native support for acquire release. I just can't remember their instructions, and I ran out of slide. So I stuck to the stuff I knew. But they do have that. So what can we do of these cool new um, atomics that we've got? We can actually use them to build generic locks. And that's precisely what we've done. This was, oh, this was a cake for my mate's birthday. I think it's awesome. But um, can we have our cake and eat it? Yes, we can, even if it's a PDP-11. <laughs> so. We get portability, because we implement our locks in core code, and they just work for everybody. We don't need any extra assembly code. You can also port them to bare metal, which I've done for some of our locks. And then you can do things like formally verify them, model check them, stuff like that. Um, you get great performance, because we're using acquire release and relaxed. Um, at least as good performance as you could have, get if you could have gotten if you'd written it by hand in assembly. Um, and the advantage of having locks in one place means that actually everyone could put their efforts all on that one implementation and do things like formal modeling, rather than having to formally model 25 different locking implementations for different architectures. So I'll go through a couple of examples, but I'm not going to go into depth because the algorithms are really, really complicated. I um, just want to kind of give you a feel for how these things are being used. <laughs> so here's, here's the QRW lock. The thing to bear in mind here is that we, we're taking a union of an atomic T, which is the CNTS, the counts, and then we've got a struct overlaying it. So what we can do is we can, we can do things like SMP store release to those individual members of the struct, or we can do atomic comp exchanges on the whole word. Um, and this kind, of, uh, this kind of design just does lend itself to using all of the APIs that we already have. You don't have to start rolling ASMs and things like that. And this will just work for different architectures. They just have to select something in kconfig, I think, and include a file, and then they're done. They get the queued read write lock. And there's a spin lock at the bottom, which is a bit cryptic. That's where the queuing happens. Um, but probably won't go into this. If you want to know more, come and grab me afterwards. I can talk more about how it works. <laughs> so these are the kind of operations that we do to, to take this lock. Um, so for the right lock, we're doing a comp exchange on the whole word. So it's going to be an atomic comp exchange with acquire semantics, because we're taking the lock. We're acquiring the lock. Everything in the critical section has to happen after we got the lock. When we want to unlock, it's the opposite, right? It's release. We want everything in the critical section to have happened before we release the lock. So that's going to be a clear that specific field to zero with the release semantic. So it'll probably be an SMP store release on that byte. And, and there are similar operations for, for the read lock. You've got an increment if W mode is zero. So that'll be a comp exchange acquire. And the decrement of the read account will be an atomic, probably atomic dec uh, release, something like that. And the, the spin lock gives us this free queuing. Um, but the numbers for this are quite good. So what we used to have on ARM64, we used to roll our own, like every other architecture. And you have like a small piece of assembly where you're doing your, your read-write lock using a completely different algorithm, because when you're writing an assembly, it's quite difficult to implement these complex algorithms. And, and we found that we were getting lockups in the task list lock when tasks were trying to exit. So if loads of tasks exited at the same time, our machine would hang, basically, for a really long time. And the problem is writers couldn't get in with our algorithm. They were being starved. So if there was a steady stream of readers, the writer would never get the lock. It wasn't fair. So on the, the, the first few numbers are here for, uh, from lock torture. And you see there's a 191 to 1 ratio of readers taking this to write. 
And this is only for eight readers and two writers. It's not like for thousands of readers. It's just got eight. And they're just coming in at a steady stream. And you can see the read count, because this is printed every two seconds or something. The read account is increasing dramatically, and the write account's going really slowly. Whereas for the one at the bottom, we're using this queued read write lock algorithm, which is just written in generic code. Okay, the throughput's lower, which you'd expect, but the writers are actually getting in there. And we're seeing a six to one ratio, which is much better. It fixed all of our lockups. Um, hooray for generic code. So it's, it's not only does it work, but it's actually better. The generic code is better, and it's written in higher level um, kernel code, not rolling our own assembly, and it works for all architectures. So it's quite, quite a good success story for that. Another one we've got is the Q spin lock. This is hideously complicated, but it's based on something called MCS locks, which are described in this paper way back in 1991. Um, <laughs> and the idea is, instead of having a single spin lock word that everyone pounds on, and you have to keep moving the cache line around all the time, you spread the thing out like a linked list. So on the left here, the, the top state is the lock word, it's unlocked. The second state, somebody holds, holds the lock, that R means runnable, this is taken straight from their paper. So someone's come in, they've got the lock, they point the lock word at their node, which in the paper is dynamically allocated, which is insane, but that's what they do. Um, and then you, you have that uh, lock and it's runnable. If people want to come in and take the lock, they then queue behind you and update the lock word to point at the last guy in the queue. And when you unlock, you just write to the next guy in the queue. So you always write, you always spin on your own cache line and the guy that unlocks writes directly to it. So you kind of distributed the lock word. Linux, as a much better implementation. So we've got optimizations for low contention case for sort of two or three threads. Um, so we don't have to go through the hassle of inserting into a queue, which is quite expensive. Um, we avoid dynamic node allocations. We don't have to allocate these things dynamically. And we squeeze the whole thing into a 32-bit atomic T. So then we have a very similar thing to the queued read write lock, where you have an atomic T with a union and anonymous things in there. <laughs> and this thing performs really well. So this was on ARM64 after I had to make some changes because we, we tried modeling it and it actually didn't guarantee that you'd ever get the lock, which was a bad property for the lock. But once we fixed that, um, we got some nice numbers out of it. So you can see that the purple line is a test and set lock, which is just a, a single bit. Um, <clears throat> so everyone's going to hammer on that. It's not going to be too good. And actually, the green, the green line's a ticket lock, which you think might, I thought would do a bit better. It doesn't do too well. So you can see as the number of cores along the bottom increases, the total number of acquisitions just plummets for both of those. And this is only up to 44 cores. I did another one with up to 256 cores, and they, I mean, these things just become unusable, basically. Whereas the Q-spin lock, we've got our optimizations for the lower core counts, which kind of kick in, and then once you actually start queuing, it just levels off, and it's lovely. And that just keeps going if you do a 256 uh, core system as well, it just keeps going. So again, generic code does a great job. And so, you know, enabling this for your architecture, it's a little bit more difficult, because you have to make sure that your memory model fits with what this algorithm does. Um, but for most architectures, you, it just means ripping out the old implementation, select a k-config symbol, and you're away. You've got this. So the one thing that held me back for ages for enabling this stuff on, on M64 was I didn't really trust that it worked, because it gets a lot of testing on x86. But x86 is quite forgiving with this memory model and with its atomics. So we put a lot of work into ver verifying the, uh, the core, um, core algorithms. So if, some, some of the tools you can use if you, you're trying to play around with relaxed atomics. There's a Linux kernel memory model, which is now merged in mainline. There's a paper about it there, um, about frightening small children. And this lives under tools memory model. So you can go in there and you can, you can basically give this tool a fragment of C code, uh, well, stylized C code. I'll explain this in a minute. And it will come back and tell you whether or not um, it can satisfy a certain constraint. So example here, this is called CMP plus PO locks. So you have two functions, P0 and P1. And the idea is that each function is just going to be run concurrently with each other. So you can think of them as processors. <laughs> and you can write something that looks a bit like kernel code in there, very much like kernel code here. So we've got write onces, spin locks. And each function gets called with pointers to global shared variables. So when P1 refers to X, it's the same X that P0 is referring to. And you've got some local variables as well on P1. So it's going to read Y and read X and do some locking. And then at the end, you can say, hey, after this runs, is it possible that on P1, R0 is 1 and R1 is 0? That's how you read this exist clause down there. So you can, you can take this as is um, on your laptop, uh, feed it to this tool, 
and it'll go away and think about it for about a tenth of a second, and then it will say, that's how you invoke it, by the way, at the top. <laughs> it'll say, right, for this test, there are three possible outcomes, which are those states that are listed there, and the one that you asked for in the exist clause, it's not one of them, it doesn't exist. So you can rely on that never happening. And that can be useful if you, if you can describe your concurrent algorithm as a small test, a small self-contained, they call litmus tests. You can just feed it to this thing um, and it will tell you what the, whether it's allowed or not. And, and the, out, the output from this tool, it might be slightly conservative. <laughs> it might, if it's not sure, it will say, um, yes, it can happen. So it won't, it won't give you guarantees where the guarantee doesn't exist. Um, but what it will do, it will ensure that that code is portable across all architectures supported by Linux. Things it can't do, unfortunately, it can't deal with compiler transformations, it can't deal with preemption, and it can't deal with I.O. So for those kind of problems, you can't use it. But for lots of little concurrency problems, you can definitely use this. And you can also get it to generate tests as kernel modules, and then you can run them on your hardware to check that your hardware is not giving different results from what the, what the tool says. So another tool that we've used, so we've used that for validating certain bits of the kernel and making sure that we're within the memory model. Another tool we used was TLA+, which is a temporal logic um, language. So this has some plus sides, because you can reason about things eventually happening. So you can say, hey, for this lock, will everyone eventually get the lock? So you've got full progress guarantee. Or you can say, is it the case that I can never reach a state where two people hold the lock at the same time? And it can go away and reason about that within a bounded set of threads. Uh, the only problem with TLA+, is it doesn't do any memory model whatsoever. So you kind of need to use all the tools together. Um, and no one so far has made a tool which can do everything in one go. I think, I mean, people get PhDs out of this, so it's, they'll get there eventually, but there's, there's some people at MIT working on a tool which will do that. So for us, we've managed to model QRW lock, Q spin lock, and even our meltdown mitigation code. We managed to say that a, you can never get to a state where there are TLB entries when we're in user space, things like that. And we've uploaded that to this, this Git repo if you want to have a play. The syntax is bloody horrible. Um, but it's a useful tool, nonetheless. So yeah, we've, we've proved exclusiveness and forward progress for QRW lock, Q spin lock with those, those configurations there. And then that applies to all architectures, which is nice. And then if you want to get really low level, you can use this thing called herd tools, which is actually what the Linux kernel memory model is built on top of. And this, you actually give it assembly instructions for your, your uh, architecture, and it will tell you what the, what the behavior is. So for example, if you wanted to rely on if you thought that maybe on x86 power and ARM a certain behavior held that Linux kernel memory model doesn't give you and your code was only ever going to run on those architectures, you could potentially use this tool uh, to, to see if that holds. And you can draw pretty pictures of the executions as well, as you can see there. But it's a very similar kind of thing, right? You have an exist clause in a program. It's just with assembly instructions. And it, it, in this case, it comes back and says, yeah, the, that exist clause is satisfied in one out of four cases. So this is all good. Um, we still can't escape testing. You still have to do lots and lots and lots of testing. And having the, having the generic lock implementations in core code means that you automatically get cross-arch testing. So I kind of just treat the formal stuff as another form of testing at the moment, because it's not quite at the point where you can just hit a button and it says, yeah, proved, good job. So there are some modules that you can use for lock torture and stuff like that. <laughs> you might think, what on earth does this have to do with me? Um, so the reason I'm presenting all of this is I think there are, there are two sides to this. One, I want adoption of this stuff. Uh, and I think there are, having people try this out and try to use it is really important, but also having maintainers be more receptive to this in, in patch review, and even just people doing review generally. So if you receive a patch that uses relaxed or weak atomics, um, I think this is kind of a, a checklist of what the kind of steps you can go through rather than just reject it outright and say, I don't understand that, use the fully ordered version. So to be honest, most people don't need it. Most people can get away with RCU or locking or other high-level interfaces, right? You just call into them and they deal with the concurrency for you. But if you are going to use them, you should prefer a quiet release to SMP MB or even any of the SMP uh, barriers because they're they both have subtleties and they're really expensive. Um, the quiet release, I think, is it, it it's almost self-documenting. It shows you the variables which are being modified and you can see the data flow. Um, Probably discourage legacy of the discourage legacy use of the return ops if you can. Uh, again, because of that full MB semantic, which you normally don't need. <laughs> make sure that acquire release are paired. We already have rules to say that make sure barriers are paired, and the way you do that is by putting a comment in saying that it pairs with this other thing, and then 
someone changes that code and doesn't update the comment, and it's completely useless. So yeah, try to pair them. If you can avoid it, don't mix and match them with barriers. You can't always avoid that. Um, I would still encourage comments uh, to show what the pairing is. And try to express it as a litmus test for LKMM. But if you just want to cheat, you can also just CC these people and have them review the patch. Uh, that, well, I, I would be willing to do that if it's what it takes to get this stuff off the ground. Um, and there's a few other people in maintainers as well who like receiving email. You can always CC them. So that's about it, really. I just wanted to make the point that the low level concurrency primitives we have are pretty good at the moment. They're in a, a decent shape. We've got a I think we're probably ahead of most languages. Um, you can just take off-the-shelf synchronization code for your architecture and get great performance, um, which has been formally verified in places. Um, and yeah, generic code doesn't have to suck anymore. Uh, it used to, but it's pretty good now. And that's it. Any questions? Yep. Oh, thank you. Wonderful thing. So um, part of the design of an API is supposed to be naming it, right? Mm -hmm. So you got this relaxed thing, but we're already using relaxed in a kernel. How does your relaxed relate to something like read relaxed? Ah, OK. Right, good question. Yeah, so we already use relaxed to, well, I think everyone heard it. We re use relaxed elsewhere. So read L relaxed, for example, is um, as for I.O. And it has a similar kind of semantic in the sense that it doesn't provide any ordering guarantees. Um, but you're right that there is, there is a collision between the I.O. accesses and the RAM, sort of normal memory accesses in, in the naming. We could change the, uh, the atomics. The problem is I, I want them to be on par, really, or relate to what's going on in all other programming languages. So if you look at things like C++ again, or if you look at the conversations that happen around Java, and uh, even Perl is now having a memory model, which is insane. Uh, relaxed is basically what they use to talk about the, um, the unordered version, the unsequenced version. So yes, there is, a, there is a naming collision. It doesn't really relate, I'd say. Treat, treat the I.O. accesses separately from the, uh, the RAM accesses. OK, but I was more getting at the point that in the I.O. operations, the mm -hmm. problem we have is that the uh, I.O. domain and the CPU memory domain mm -hmm. are not if effectively, ordering between them is very difficult. Yep. So uh, by definition, all reads and writes are supposed to have an, what's called an I.O. memory barrier, which means <laughs> that you're supposed to flush the I.O. bus mm -hmm. as well as the memory bus. Mm -hmm. And relaxed means don't do that because I know what I'm doing. It's yep. basically the beware of all of this. Yep. But when I read your relaxed, it's sort of like you're only a single domain, right? Mm -hmm. So all it means is that we just give up on the ordering primitives according to the CPU. But yeah. it doesn't imply giving up on any ordering primitives related to the IO bus. So it would, it would still interact correctly with a, so if you, for example, if you did a load of atomic relaxed access, accesses to memory, and then you did a write L, that's still going to order all of those relaxed accesses, if that helps. Yes, that's because we've got a barrier in yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> OK, just curious. Yeah. You can think of them as just loads and stores, really, the relaxed stuff. They're, they're the same as read once and write once. Anyone else? Oh, one at the back. Good morning. <clears throat> With your trust zone system, if the system has an SAU in it, how does that work? With the what, sorry? With a secure address unit for addressable memory in, in a T environment. Mm -hmm. Does it still work? Does the, does what still works, sorry, I don't think The I relaxed think. access to memory, where it, there is an ordering down in the memory unit of the trust zone based system. It should be exactly the same, yeah, unless I don't understand the question, but it, the, the trust zone should have no impact on the memory model. Okay. Okay, cool. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>